everybody. So, um, my name is uh, Clemens Gregor Schmid, um, and I'm your instructor for the next, um, how long do we have? Two hours? I guess two hours, so something along the lines. <clears throat> All right, so this is about R. All right, so <clears throat> um, this file here, this is not an R script, it's an R markdown document, <clears throat> which is a, um, a sort of um, document that combines um, text information and code. So you can basically um, <clears throat> develop uh, text and code together, um, which is useful if you prepare a presentation because this thing here can render it to a PDF document. It's essentially the, the base for this um, um, PDF here. Uh, but um, of course, um, there are a number of things in here that are not uh, terribly useful. Um, in um, our current teaching environment. I would ask you to safely ignore them. For example, this YAML header here and this um, code chunk here in the beginning, which is just, just for setup. Instead, we can scroll to line 30. Um, <clears throat> I assume that it might be a little different for you now um, because um, you have a slightly different version of the script if git pull worked for you. But if you scroll further a little, um, a little down, then you should en um, encounter this um, table of content sections. <clears throat> okay, I see Alice Lee writing as a minute ago. Um, I can't find the directory, but I don't understand how we're supposed to open anything. Aha. Um, well, I mean, um, open anything. This is something that um, has to be done uh, started from our studio. So you press file and then um, open project. And from here you have some file browser and there you can select the, our project file and open that. Um, <clears throat> if this um, is still confusing or does not work for you, then I would maybe ask you to um, quickly um, <clears throat> um, do a one-on-one um, -on -one with, with Nikolai in this gray bottom corner of the um, our Purple Gather Town room. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I get the feeling that uh, most people are now here. Um, and um, that would mean that we are finally in the position to start talking about R. <clears throat> and in my opinion, also, I, most likely this was already the most difficult thing <laughs> that we um, encountered today, setting up. OK, so what are we talking today? Um, <clears throat> well, um, I will first of all, um, yeah, OK. So I will first of all um, talk a little bit about the um, working environment, so about R. R Studio and the, the Tidyverse. Then um, we are going to look into how to load data into R into data structures called tibbles. Then we will learn how to plot data in these tibbles. Then we will do conditional queries on these tibbles and then even transform and manipulate these tibbles and finally combine tibbles with join operations. So it will be a lot about these nifty things called tibbles. All right. So um, the working environment. Well, <clears throat> what is R? R is a fully featured programming language. <clears throat> but it excels as one thing in particular. is It excels as an environment for statistical data analysis. So <clears throat> that is. Um, um, yeah, um, a specific feature, the language is targeted for this particular purpose, and it's very optimized for it as well. R is an interpreter programming language, and that means <clears throat> you do not have to compile the code to run it. You run it in an interactive session, and that is what this thing here on the bottom is. That is the R console. It should be able to grab this um, intermediate um, frame here and move it a little bit up to see what's going on here on the bottom. And you see R is starting and you have some sort of um, console running here. You should have, if you click inside, you should have a blinking cursor here. And then we can um, send commands to R and R uh, will interpret them and then will give us um, meaningful um, results. So we could, for example, type 
one plus one in here. And then press enter to run, run the command. And what we get is two R. So R is able to um, very easily answer our questions in terms of simple algebra. Yeah? That is, um, yeah, you could, you could really uh, um, <clears throat> treat R as some sort of uh, clever uh, calculator. Here we go. All right, and then um, <clears throat> um, the second thing um, that is important for today is R Studio, and that is this program we are using right now. Uh, this is R Studio, which is an integrated development environment for R and other languages. So an integrated development environment means it's a, a software that is uh, optimized to develop code in a specific uh, programming language. Um, and um, our studio is indeed optimized for this purpose. Uh, purpose. <clears throat> um, it is, um, <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, it, it has this, um, uh, these four um, panels here, no? the top left here, that is usually the script you're running, the bottom left, which is the R console, the top right, which is the environment, um, <clears throat> or um, like allows us um, like a, a number has a, a number of different features available in different tabs for us, and then the bottom right corner here, which is um, yet another um, <clears throat> collection of um, nifty things um, that are um, useful to develop our, for example, a window to display plots or um, a browser of all the um, external packages and libraries we're using and so forth. We will encounter these things as they become um, um, meaningful and helpful for what we are doing now. And then finally, the tidyverse. What is the tidyverse? Well, the tidyverse is a collection of packages with a well-designed and consistent interface for the main steps of data analysis, which are Loading data, transforming data, plotting data. That is um, the um, key goal of the, the tidyverse, providing a, a streamlined, um, well interlinked um, environment for exactly these core steps of data analysis. In this introduction, we will work with tidyverse version 1.3.0, at least approximately. Uh, plus minus um, the changes are not that big between the versions so you should be we should not encounter any issues even with older versions and we will learn about the packages read r tibble ggplot2 deploy r magrid r and tidy r sounds like a lot and pretty confusing but we will go through it uh, step by step we will also quickly talk about the package four cats please mention it and then there are two interesting tidyverse packages per and string r which we will not cover today because they are either a little bit specific or um, <clears throat> for more advanced applications. Okay, at this point, um, <clears throat> um, the, the theory and introduction I wanted to cover is done. And I would jump now into the actual data analysis. And at this point, I would try to recover once more everybody I've lost so far. <clears throat> um, so um, I want to quickly ask, um, are there still open questions? I see in the chat, um, um, that somebody cannot find the project. So one more time, no? <clears throat> you click here on the top left corner of, uh, for file, um, then um, open a project, then you have to navigate to the root directory and to vol, volume 3b, introduction to the tidyverse, and then the spam r tidyverse um, intro. And here there is this r project file, and that is the file you have to open with r studio. So again, here is the full path. Um, since the opening command doesn't seem to work at all. Uh -huh. Okay. Nora Bergfeld, could you confirm whether you um, were able to follow these steps? So are you now um, um, where we're supposed to be? Yeah, I gave a thumbs up, but yeah, it works now. Thanks. Oh, excellent. Okay. All right. I unfortunately cannot see everybody here at the same time. Okay. No? 
I don't know. All right. Um, <clears throat> and then, um, Alice Lee, um, you have issues um, in um, uh, getting our studio to work. Maybe you encounter the same issue as I did. Um, you have to run it in the um, terminal where you have activated the R Python environment. I think um, that's the only um, direct and easy way to open it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Nicola, I think Alice is in the bottom right um, corner here. Um, maybe you could join her and see if you could solve this in a one on one session. Or maybe you're already doing it. I don't know. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> but I, I guess um, um, most of you, or almost all of you, are now here, right? Oh, yeah. I got our studio to open. Oh, yeah. I see. Okay. All right, um, so if you have RStudio open, um, then you can um, open the project. Um, just um, one last time, just because repetition is helpful now. Open project, then click on computer, navigate to vol volume 3B, and then here. And here, this is the project file you have to open. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, we open the presentation RMD file, and you can scroll down to reading data with R. So what is that? Um, <clears throat> well, um, with R, we usually operate on data in our computer's memory, and we have to get this the data no, that we have maybe in some text files or in a database or whatnot or on the internet. We have to get that into um, our uh, memory. And um, the Tigerverse provides a very um, convenient and useful package for exactly this purpose. Uh, purpose. And the package is called ReadR. ReadR is there to read data from text files into memory. And uh, ReadR is brilliant because it can read um, data from our file system or directly from the internet. And it can read all sorts of text data. Um, I can read CSV files, TSV files, um, tabular files with an arbitrary separator. Maybe you have a file with uh, a pipe as a separator or something. You can read fixed width files, which are still um, common if you use um, like um, <clears throat> older command line software tools, and they sometimes have output in a fixed width file uh, format. Um, reader can you see, um, read these. And then reader can even read files line by line so that you can write your parser yourself. So um, <clears throat> reader has all these features. And reader is even more clever because it automatically detects column types. Um, you can uh, define them manually, but it has a, um, a brilliant feature to automatically detect if a column in your CSV file um, in your table um, is a text um, text string, or is if it is a, a, a double, or if it uh, is an, an integer, or if it is um, <clears throat> um, a date, uh, for example. So um, reader is uh, pretty clever in that regard. Um, so um, how does this um, this work? How do um, we use these brilliant functions in the reader package? Well. Um, that leads us to the question, how do we figure out anything in R? How can we um, uh, yeah, learn about um, how, if, how we could use a function? Well, for that, there is a um, cool operator in R, and this is this question mark operator. It allows us to open the help file of a particular function. So <clears throat> you, can, um, you can go to our R console and type question mark and then the name of the package and the name of the function separated um, by this, um, this column colon operator, which defines the namespace. So this is a read CSV function from the package read R. And we want to see the help file for it. And if we do this, 
and then uh, press enter, then something magical happens because something opens here in the bottom right corner of our RStudio um, <clears throat> integrated development environment. The help file for um, this function or this means this is a combined help file for um, all um, these um, functions I mentioned here above. So you see you have um, a um, huge amount of text. First of all, which, op um, which options do these individual functions have? They have a ton. And then um, we have um, <clears throat> descriptions for each of these um, individual arguments um, and uh, we can read up on how to use them. So um, looking at the help, um, the, the help file um, is um, crucial. And um, fortunately, in the whole R infrastructure, um, it is very common to write um, extensive and useful um, help files. So um, it's very much enforced um, in the ecosystem of the language that every function has some sort of help file. And you should always um, <clears throat> consult them if you use a function for the first time. OK, so um, <clears throat> now um, a little bit more about this read CSV function. So I told you this function has a, a ton of options. And, um, <clears throat> um, we, can, we can go through a number of them to understand a little bit better how, um, how this works. The first one is the file. No? And this is uh, the only really mandatory option of this function, the only one that does not have a default value. So um, here, because the other function, the, uh, the other um, arguments have um, default values, but the file one does not, no? because we have to give this function a path, a directory path, or a URL um, where it can find the file we want to read. And then um, <clears throat> we can um, configure the way um, this function um, reads this file. For example, um, we can answer the question if this file has column names. No? So um, uh, you could very easily imagine a table or a data file that has no column names. So then you would set call names to false. Then you can um, set uh, the column types. You see the default argument here for the column types is null. No? And that is exactly what I already mentioned. If this is null, um, so some sort of an A value in R, then our, um, um, read R will attempt to automatically detect the column types. Brilliant thing. <clears throat> then uh, the read CSV function has an option called local, right? um, which is um, the um, encoding information in this file. Um, I guess that is something that is uh, very relevant in such an um, international audience as, as um, you are, right? Um, so <clears throat> you might have a file that has um, characters um, that are um, not Latin, simple Latin characters. And then you may sometimes want to um, set the, the local specifically. Could you zoom in a little bit? Maxim, ah, okay. All right. <clears throat> um, so yeah, this um, um, read CSV function has a uh, CSV function has a, a ton of options, and we can very specifically set how we want to re um, read um, a file. Now let's um, run it. Let's see what happens. So um, <clears throat> we will now run this um, read um, um, read a file, and it's a TSV file, so a tab separated file. That's why we use read TSV. Um, and we run this on this sample URL um, defined above here. Um, <clears throat> of course, um, if you run this, if you try to run this like this here immediately, then you will encounter an error here. Um, so uh, if we take this and copy it down here, so run this. No, no, cannot read it because the object sample table URL is not found. Oh, that is an issue. So um, this this um, file argument here, no? um, essentially like this, no? this is missing. So we have to, first of all, um, load this into memory. How do we do this? Well, we go back up. Here, for me, it's line 58. Um, <clears throat> and then um, we can um, select um, this um, string, um, or this, this command here and copy it down here. Uh, 
and then run it again with danger and something magical happens suddenly we have a value in our environment here in the top right um, corner now we have a, a simple string a simple character value sample table url with this url here in the um, top right um, corner and now we um, actually can can inspect this value and look at it so we can just type the value in here and fire and then here we get it back brilliant and that means if we have run that we can go back here and again take this section of the code copy it down here and fire ah excellent now it worked now it did something Actually, um, what did it do? We read this file into an object called um, samples. Uh, it's also here now in the top right corner. So this is our um, this environment browser um, shows us always the objects that we have in our current environment. Um, <clears throat> and then we get some some um, output here from read CSV, some command line output that we can read and understand. Uh, can you quickly repeat where you copied into? Um, <clears throat> well, I always copy just here in the bottom into this console window here in the top, uh, uh, bottom left um, corner. Uh, then I'll just press enter. So um, you should have your script here in the top, on the top, and your um, R console here on the bottom. And they are, um, yeah. Okay, okay, excellent. All right, so we were about to, to read this, this um, command line um, output. So <clears throat> read R um, read a TSV file with 1060 rows and 60 columns. And it automatically detected the column types and it found 12 character columns. No? These, these are the 12 character columns it found. And it found four columns that it identified as numerical. So, um, and it assigned it to, to double. So, um, of course, the publication year is not necessarily a double, but um, um, for um, um, yeah, um, reader, it reads numbers um, apparently as, as doubles automatically. Okay. So, um, yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> my, my Wi Fi. Uh, my Wi-Fi has an error, and I miss a little. I don't know why uh, all the things uh, get error. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, um, so you you um, you are trying this, but you are not getting the result you expect. Yeah, since the beginning, I have error in the room uh, argument. File is missing, um, uh, something like that. <laughs> um, also, error read. Really, uh, share your screen. Um, I think this is important so that we are um, getting this set up correctly, because everything yeah. else downstream depends on it. Uh, yes. Um... So I guess I have to quickly unshare. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it is. Uh, all right, okay. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> you encountered a number of errors. And um, <clears throat> um, so you tried to run code which was not supposed to be run. That is the first error you encountered. But then, then here um, in this, this line with the samples, no? um, so um, where we create the samples object, there you encounter exactly the same issue um, that um, I already encountered here. You have to scroll up a little bit to find this code section where we define the sample table URL um, um, object. So okay. um, if, you, if you go to the script again and then um, scroll up, um, yeah, it's it's further up. This one? No, no, not further up. Further, more, give me more, even more. Here, here it is. And this, no? 
this one here in line 58 yeah <clears throat> um, okay. you can um, <clears throat> um, copy this um, um, this code here and um, paste it down so you have to copy also like the, the entire string with it everything okay. until line 59 uh, yeah excellent and then you type uh, press enter here you go and then you can press the um, <clears throat> the up key um, so um, you can press um, the, um, the arrow up key on your keyboard the yeah to mm -hmm. recover a an, um, command you already use so um, the arrow this on your arrow yeah okay only just copy uh, this one here that's also fine sorry uh, Okay, thank you. Okay, here you go. Right. Then we are all on the same page. Okay, so then I will share my screen again. And I'm back here. <clears throat> so uh, we were just about to figure out what this sample object actually is. Um, and I can already tell you what it is. It is one of these tibbles. Now, what is a tibble? Well, a tibble is a data frame, which is not a particularly helpful thing to say now, but um, a data frame is a tabular data structure with rows and columns. And unlike a simple array in maybe another programming language, um, each column in a tibble or data frame can have another data type. So we can have a string column, we can have a number column, and um, this makes <coughs> um, tibbles um, or data frames incredibly powerful and useful for data analysis because that's the data structure we usually have. We usually have some sort of table uh, um, and this table has different columns with different data types. <clears throat> and therefore um, this data structure is already optimized. Um, and um, the, the, um, uh, <clears throat> the way this data structure is integrated in R is already a good pointer to how well they are is optimized for data analysis. Okay, so now um, the question arises, how do we look at this samples thing? How do we get an idea of what actually is in there? Maybe we scroll down a little bit. And the easiest way to look at an object in R is by just um, typing its names, name. So we can just type samples on the command line, press enter, and then we get a um, neat printed output of this um, um, of this very object. And this print here is optimized to show us um, as much information as possible. First thing we recognize, this is a table uh, with 1060 rows, 60 column, uh, 16 columns. Then we have different columns here, and we get the first um, <clears throat> a couple of columns shown here. Uh, there are more columns which are um, hidden down here. And we get the first 10 rows um, to get an idea of what is in this data. So um, <clears throat> that is already a, a useful um, view on the data to understand um, that um, this is a, a tibble and what is structure is, what is data, uh, what is columns is, what the column types are, and so forth. <clears throat> um, then um, you can also become more technical. Um, you can look um, get a structural overview of this data um, uh, data set. Um, so we um, can look at um, this str um, function and apply it to the samples object. Huh? <clears throat> and what we get here is a, a more technical output um, uh, that shows us the different columns um, and what kind of, of class um, this, um, this uh, tibble object is and so forth. Um, quite often we do not have to look at this, especially not if you're an R novice or an R beginner. But later on, it's very useful to understand the structure of these um, complex list-like data structures. There's another command, uh, another function called summary that we can apply to our data um, on our table. And this is um, more useful um, <clears throat> from a human um, readability perspective because it gives us an overview of all these uh, different columns um, and um, gives us some summary statistics for them right away. Huh? So. Um, for example, the sample age here we have, no? and then uh, we get the, the minimum of this column and the maximum of this column and 
mean and the median, which already is useful information um, <clears throat> depending on um, our understanding of the data in the first place. And then, and that is extremely useful and extremely useful of the R Studio IDE. There is a, um, a function called view. And um, <clears throat> if we run view, then again, something magical happens. So I copy this view command, put it down here, press enter, and then something new opens here in the top left corner. And, um, <clears throat> It's a, 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 um, a browser for this table where we can, can inspect the whole data set, now, where we see it like um, just as we would see it in, um, in Excel or something. Yeah? So um, this is um, incredibly helpful because um, quite often summaries um, just um, hide the details and we want to inspect um, these data objects um, more precisely. Have you also have um, useful features here like a search function and so forth. Yeah? yeah. Okay, it gets a little bit slow um, and unreliable for gigantically large uh, data sets. So uh, be careful if your um, data set is um, in the millions of rows. Okay, we can close this window again to go back to our script. Um, and um, um, now um, dive into a little bit of a boring part, but I have to do it. Sorry, we have to talk a little bit about indexing. <clears throat> so um, these um, samples, uh, this, this object here, this is a data frame or a tibble, uh, and uh, tibbles are tables. And of course, we need a way to index them. And R has um, some basic infrastructure for this, which is quite important. Uh, if you <clears throat> um, append um, uh, this, these angular brackets to um, our object. And then um, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, um, yeah, um, give indexes here, you can access specific values. So for example, with this operation here, uh, one comma one, we access the value in the first row and column. So if we copy this, uh, then we get the very first value in our data frame. Um, as you can observe here, now this is Warner 2014, first row, first column. Um, <clears throat> and then um, we can access this very value um, in a um, um, yeah, very easy and accessible manner. We can also only index um, on one thing, uh, <clears throat> for example, only rows. Um, the first um, um, value before the comma, that is for the rows. So to get the first row of our um, samples object, we can just run this. And we can also do the very same thing for columns. This is just the thing after the comma. Uh, this would be the, the first column of our data set here, the project name. Um, <clears throat> this also works um, with um, vectors. So we can access multiple um, rows and columns at once. Um, so uh, with something like this, we can access a, um, a subset of our data set. So basically just a, a rectangle taken just um, right out of our, um, our big table. And here we encounter something new that we haven't seen before. And these are these vectors. Vectors in R, no? they just start with a C. And then um, um, simple, simple um, um, parentheses. And the vector is just a list of values. And all of these values have to have the same type. So now, so now we have a vector with, uh, with um, one, two, three. And now we can add another one for, <clears throat> here we go. This indexing um, in R also um, works um, in a negative way. So you can exclude things. With this command here, we would exclude, so with this minus, the first two columns. So we're after the comma, so columns, uh, and then the minus, and then a vector with two columns. So with this thing, we would get a version of our sample data set that has two columns missing here at the very beginning. You see the, the project is not um, uh, here anymore. And um, this um, indexing also is not, uh, cannot just be done with, um, <clears throat> with numbers. So with indexes, uh, indexes, 
but also with um, names, with column names. So um, with um, this, this command here, we would just get a, a subset of our uh, table with only two columns, two column site name and material. Um, one thing that um, <clears throat> some of you may already have seen, uh, um, the indexes in R start with one. That's a little bit unusual. In many programming languages, indexing starts at zero. In R, indexing starts at one. Okay, and then one very last comment on um, for the more computer science here, um, people among you. Um, tables are also mutable data structures. Structures, so um, you can easily override their content. We can, for example, run this this line here, uh, where we index the very first value, like the top left corner of our ta table and then override it with something else. Now, this replaces the first value in the first column. Here we go. And then we can inspect our samples object again. I'm just uh, typing its name here. And we get now our cheesecake to the cheesecake 2015 in the very first value. OK, so this was um, pretty technical and um, <clears throat> um, Maybe a little bit abstract and not particularly useful. So let's go to something that is useful. Let's go to plotting. Let's make some plots, make some graphics. So, and for that, we will look at ggplot2 and the grammar of graphics. ggplot2 is also a, a package in um, the um, tidyverse um, framework. And it offers a little bit unusual, but incredibly powerful. And if you understand it, logical interface to make graphics. Um, let's dive right in uh, with an example. Um, but before we can do that, we have to do um, one thing. We have to load the, the library. Uh, <clears throat> because um, ggplot2 is not part of base R, so we don't have this function available right away. We um, have to um, make them these functions available by uh, with a call to the library command. So we call library ggplot2. And I want to use the opportunity to do uh, to introduce something else that um, may um, speed up um, our progress here. We do not actually have to always copy these things from our script on the top to the console on the bottom. There is a better way. We can just select some code up here and then press control enter and it would will automatically, automatically be um, running the console on the bottom. So you select the text, and then you press Control, um, Enter, and it will be run automatically. And it's even more brilliant. You can just put your cursor anywhere in a line of code and press Control, Enter then, and then um, um, it will also just run this whole line on the bottom. Very useful. OK, um, now back to ggplot. Um, this is um, a, um, um, the, the code that we need um, for one already pretty useful plot. We can select it and run it with um, Control Enter. And we get this. Ha! If we run this thing, then our studio shows us the result right away in um, the bottom right part. <clears throat> so um, um, here, this, um, <clears throat> this plot here now is a, a stacked bar chart. And we will go through the details um, in a second. I quickly want to monitor the chat if I lost anybody on the way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We have different numbers of lines um, depending on whether the git pull command worked or not, um, which is, of course, not. It's not clear to me why this is, but anyway. Um, so um, for me, this this code now exists in line one hundred forty nine to line one hundred fifty seven. For you, it might be somewhere else. Okay, <clears throat> so back to ggplot. Um, <clears throat> for if, if you want, well, want to run ggplot, then we always start with the ggplot function. Every plot starts with a call to the ggplot function. And this function no, can also take in our input data right away. 
Uh, so it has a data argument, and there we place our tibble. Um, <clears throat> and then, then um, uh, if you run this, um, nothing actually happens. No, there's, there's nothing going on. We have to um, add a so-called geom. And geoms are brilliant. Um, I, I put this here. Geoms are basically combinations of data, some sort of visual geomet uh, geometry, some sort of statistical information, and a little bit of repositioning. So um, and um, we can we can understand this here very um, very clearly with this with this bar um, bar chart. No? If we run it again, then um, our um, geom bar takes the data, no? applies some sort of um, bar chart geometry. No? So these rectangles that uh, we, whose height are is dependent on um, a sum and the statistical transformation that is um, actually. <clears throat> Um, the, the sum huh? um, we, are, we are summing. That is a, a statistical transformation we apply to the data to produce a bar chart. <clears throat> so geoms define the plot layers we want to draw. And to do this, they need mapping. And mapping, mapping is a brilliant concept done with a function called um, um, HES for, I guess, aesthetics. And with this aesthetics function, we map visual elements of our plot, or the other way around, we map data onto visual elements of our plot. So for example, we take the publication year column of our samples data set and map it onto the x-axis of our plot. That is what is happening here. You see the publication year is in the, um, <clears throat> um, on the x-axis of our plot. And then um, um, we map um, the community type variable onto the fill color. And this is how we produce the stack bar chart. <clears throat> uh, because then um, no, the, the individual bars are um, filled according to another variable community type. So, um, and this is, this is the whole magic. So we start the plot with ggplot, add some data, then apply a geom, and for this geom, we have to do some, some mapping of variables to visual elements. And this is a very simple and logical concept. I love it. <clears throat> All right. Um, we can skip this one here. Um, this is just um, like a, a more uh, brief way to write exactly the very same thing. Um, and instead, um, look a little bit um, at um, the features of ggplot. And for that, I first of all want to highlight um, that um, ggplot um, comes with a ton of these geoms. We've seen the bar chart now, but there are a ton more. And um, for these, um, it is um, certainly worth to I put this actually in the chat um, <clears throat> to um, inspect some or to have a quick look um, at some. Um, I can do this here in the browser. Um, G cheats. Um, our studio puts out some brilliant sheet sheets for um, different parts of the um, um, yeah, data transformation packages or um, a functionality that I'm showing you today. And one of them, the very top one here, is already on cheat sheet mode. So uh, if we open that, we have a brilliant overview of all the different um, um, geoms that ggplot provides. Uh, there are geoms for box plots and for dot plots and for violin plots and for um, histograms and even for, for mapping um, <clears throat> and for um, <clears throat> two-dimensional density indicators. So there are a ton of um, geoms that allow us to um, do, um, realize pretty much any kind of um, visualization we want to realize. Um, and um, ggplot itself is not even the, the limit. Um, there are a number of packages that extend um, ggplot to um, um, include additional functionality, additional um, uh, visualizations. For example, ggplot itself does not um, have any geom for um, tree drawing, uh, which is something that um, you guys might be particularly interested in every now and then. Um, but uh, there is, for example, a package called ggraph, um, which um, has brilliant work play, uh, work play with ggraph, <clears throat> and it um, introduces um, some functionality to plot trees and networks. 
Okay, so there are a ton of these these um, geoms, but geoms are at all. Uh, it's not all. Uh, there is there is more to GG plot. For example, there are scales, <clears throat> and um, scales they control the behavior of visual elements, and that is super important. And I have an example for that. Let's run this plot here. This is a, a box plot where we um, <clears throat> um, yeah, where we map. Um, the uh, publication year to the x-axis and the sample age to the y-axis. Um, you're probably a little bit surprised by this s-factor thing. Um, that's, um, we need that um, to tell um, ggplot that publication year is um, a ordinarily scaled um, variable and not a, a continuous variable as you would expect from a number. All right, and then we so we get this plot here, um, here in the, um, the um, <clears throat> bottom right uh, corner, and um, you see um, this is not this is not uh, um, a very very helpful graphic. No? There are um, these sample ages are mostly very low, um, and then uh, the entire plot is basically um, dominated by outliers. Uh, <clears throat> so the outliers dictate the scale of this plot. And that is not that is not uh, not super helpful. So what we have to do, we have to change the scale of the y-axis. So uh, we take the very plot we just had, and then we add another element. So all these these different functions for ggplot are always combined with plus. Uh, it's a little bit of a special a special quirk of, of ggplot that all these different individual functions are combined with a plus. So we add. We literally add another um, function, which is a function to scale the y-axis um, in a logarithmic, logarithmic manner. And if we run this, then um, we get a, a plot that is uh, by far uh, more useful because the outliers are um, not as obvious anymore. So um, in this case, the log scale improves readability. Um, of course, with scales, we can also um, control the behavior of other visual elements. Um, for example, fill color. So let's imagine we map another variable to our current plot. <clears throat> and uh, we take again the publication here as factor, so um, to indicate that it's an um, ordinarily scaled uh, variable. And we, we add this here to the aesthetics um, call to um, color our um, individual bars, just for, for aesthetic reasons. <clears throat> and what we get is this. Um, oh, wait, we can also um, recover our log scale. Um, yep. <clears throat> so now all these different bars have colors, and we have some little legend here on the right that is automatically added. Um, I think these colors are horribly ugly. I don't like them. So I think we should change them. And we can do this again with a call to a scale underscore function for the fill, <clears throat> where we um, uh, um, change uh, to a different color palette. And if we run this, we get some colors that are more pleasing on the eyes. So <clears throat> um, that's it um, so far about, about scales. Um, <clears throat> there is yet another um, interesting feature of ggplot that I um, find um, important to highlight, and that is um, facets. Um, <clears throat> so um, let's quickly um, draw a plot um, um, which um, um, visualizes um, the publication year and um, the material of these samples. Uh, so we have on the y-axis the, the material, and then um, on the x-axis, uh, the publication here. And this is a count plot. Um, so um, that um, <clears throat> shows um, the amount of samples um, summed um, here as um, in the, the size or um, visualize it via the size of these, these circles. We can argue if this is a particular useful or good plot to show exactly this, but um, <clears throat> that's it. Now, that's what you have to deal with now. And now um, we imagine we want to add another variable here. We want to, for example, also distinguish 
the archive where these samples are coming from, where they are, um, where the data for them is stored. And um, here we um, <clears throat> in, in, um, encounter some sort of limit because we cannot easily do this with a color or something. Right? Color wouldn't really work. The only real way to do this would be to make these little um, um, dots here, um, tiny pie charts or something. But um, that's um, yeah, not not particularly aesthetically pleasing and also not particularly read, uh, um, readable, I think, especially for these small dots here. So what we can do, we can split the entire plot into multiple facets. So um, if we run this, then we get the same plot in three iterations for each individual um, source archive. Um, so it's it's a, a brilliant way to increase the number of variables we can we can display. And in theory, you can crank this up arbitrarily, right? You can then um, split in um, any number of groups, um, or in a, even uh, in, in um, like uh, combine multiple variables to create these groups. Okay, <clears throat> so this works, but um, I'm sure you will point out, Clemens, this plot, it looks horrible, you cannot read the x-axis. I agree. Huh? With this operation here, we squashed the x-axis and it became unreadable. So what do we do now? Nah, we need something that is a theme. So in the theme that is um, in a in ggplot terminology, um, a way to change purely visual um, aspects of a plot. For example, the orientation of um, these um, labels. So if we add uh, the theme function, we can specify how we want to have the, um, X, uh, the um, axis text of the y uh, of the x axis uh, axis text x um, displayed and we would like to uh, display it as element text um, slightly rotated with an angle and then we have to uh, just this justification a little bit um, uh, to, to um, <clears throat> make this really work so if we run this then suddenly um, the, the axis labels are turned by um, 45 degrees and uh, we can read them. That is uh, a lot more useful. All right. <clears throat> um, now we encounter an interesting issue because I prepared some exercises for you, some little ones, um, and they are not here in this version of the, of the document that I have available here. Tja. <laughs> um, well, some of you have them. Some of you certainly have them. And for the rest, well, I should be able to pull up the slides and um, you should be able um, to read them from there. So let me quickly navigate there uh, on my own file system. Um, here and then here. So, and then at the end of the ChiChiPlot section, we have an exercise. Yes. So, okay, you should still, uh, still be seeing my screen, right? That should work. So, <clears throat> um, that's what I would like you to do. Um, so, first of all, um, look at a different data set. Huh? Uh, transfer knowledge. Uh, we have to look at another data set, the empty cars data set, which is already integrated in um, R. So you can just type empty cars into your um, command line and, and uh, see it and interact with it. And I would like you to read up on the meaning of its variables. So you have to remember how to pull up the help um, for this um, uh, data set. Um, and then I would like to um, like you to make uh, two plots. Uh, first of all, um, visualize the relationship between the variables cross horsepower and um, <clears throat> the quarter mile um, time and uh, mile time. So this is the data set of our cars. And um, then um, in a final step, integrate the number of cylinders into your plot. That is the task I would like you to work on. Um, and I um, hope the examples um, that I um, introduced so far um, help you to uh, quickly realize this. 
Um, I'd suggest um, we, we work on this um, for um, five minutes first, and then let's see um, where we are and if somebody is already um, able and willing uh, to present um, what they came up with. And feel free to ask right away if you encounter any issues.
All right. <clears throat> I think I've thrown you a little bit in the, into the cold water with this exercise because you uh, have to start right away with your plot and um, <clears throat> then you even have to, to look up variable names and understand how, how these two things combine. So um, <clears throat> um, uh, it's, it's um, <clears throat> uh, no problem if you struggle a little bit with it. But is there somebody who um, um, thinks he has achieved something and would like to share their screen to quickly um, show what they've done? Ah, that is the sound of silence. But um, I saw that Tre Blom, maybe, you um, gave a thumbs up um, very early on. Would you like to share what you've got? Ah, oh, Rafaela says something. Okay. Doesn't make sense, so. <laughs> All right, yeah, show us. Show us what you got, Rafaela. I have to see how to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Gosh, now I'm struggling here. Ah, here. Yeah, it's always technicalities that make us struggle, make us struggle right? <laughs> so you can see it now, right? Mm -hmm. I see, I see. So, um, <clears throat> um, you try to run a bar chart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> um, I'm not sure if a bar chart is exactly the right kind of visualization here. But No, uh, no, I agree. This is kind of the fastest thing I could do. What I did first is I selected the data out that I wanted, which you can see here. So, I made the um, table more useful. This is what I tried first. And then I went for the bar chart because this was the fastest I could think of. Okay, okay, all right, that's good for uh, <laughs> start. Uh, maybe we can we can easily fix this. Maybe you, you switch um, to a um, point chart. So um, if you go up um, with your, with your um, key, uh, with, your, um, with the up arrow key on your keyboard. Yeah. In the, in the console, um, yeah. then you can edit what you've got. Huh? Um, and you can maybe replace the geom bar with a geom point, uh, because uh, oh, nice. plot might, might be a good visualization for this. Um, it's at least one option. And then um, replace uh, the fill the fill variable with the with the y axis, uh, because scatter plot usually plots x and y. And then let's see what this gives us. Aha! Uh -huh. That's the kind of plot I had in mind. Cool. <clears throat> um, so, um, with the idea being um, <clears throat> um, the, the higher the horsepower, the lower um, the, the quarter mile time, so the faster the car. Okay, I see. My assumption about cars, I don't know much about cars. Cool, okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> and then, then for a second exercise, integrate the number of cylinders into your plot. How could we do that? So, I will stop sharing now, right? No, you can continue sharing. You can oh. do it right away here if you're if you're um, um, one, because I think one way to do this would be to add color here, no? to um, add a mapping of a color variable. So if you edit this plot once more and add um, <clears throat> not a, not another function, but in this aesthetics mapping function, you have mapped now to, um, the HP to X and um, um, QSEC to Y, and now we could also map. Um, <clears throat> Um, uh, um, the cylinder variable, so CYL, to the color. So we would write um, QSEC comma, mm -hmm, color, um, uh, yeah, equals, no, it's not colors. This is, yeah, it's a bad suggestion. Um, no, not colors. Oh, okay. Yeah, equals CYL, cylinder. Ah, sorry. Exactly. And now let's try this. Ta-da! Mm -hmm. And we've mapped also the number of cylinders. Of course, um, <clears throat> this is now um, a more or less um, useful um, use of, of color because cylinders do not um, scale um, in a gradual scale, right? You cannot have uh, 3.5 cylinders, or can you? I don't think you can. 
um, so um, we would usually wrap this in another um, call to S factor to make it a, a modernly scaled variable. Um, but um, um, as a first start for plotting, very good. I think now you can um, unshare the screen. Cool, thank you. Okay, so I go back to mine. Um, <clears throat> In um, the version of the um, of this script you find on the website, I also have put some possible solutions where you can read up on this. But you see, we basically or basically did exactly what Rafaela now did um, uh, with this additional call to S factor. All right, um, then, huh? yeah, okay. Um, we can um, um, come to an entirely new um, section of um, this, this course. And if I look at the time, this um, might already be the last one. Let's see how, how fast we can progress. <laughs> okay, so we learned about plotting. Um, and now let's look at something um, that I would call conditional queries. So we want to ask questions um, uh, and ask the data set questions and expect the data set to answer. And the deployer package has powerful functions for exactly this purpose to be applied on uh, tibbles. And one of them um, is, um, <clears throat> uh, like we start basic, is a select function. And the select function is actually um, just something that you already did. Huh? Um, uh, it's a, a way to um, select um, columns from a data set. You already learned a way to do this, uh, but I would argue this one is more readable. If we run um, deploy a select on the samples data set and extract the columns project name, sample age, we, got exact, we get exactly this. So a tibble uh, with only these two columns. Of course, this also works with negative selection. So if we want a, a data set that has um, that does not have these two columns. No, just the very same. So this is just another way to do the very thing that we already did and that Rafaela um, just applied so nicely in her script. So filtering or selecting columns, okay, that is interesting, more or less useful, but really interesting um, things can happen if we want to, um, or if we want to subset rows. And that is what uh, the buyer does with the filter function, deploy of filter. And um, here are a couple of examples um, that um, <clears throat> uh, increase in complexity. You know? Let's start with something very simple. We give it the samples uh, data set, and then we ask for all samples where the publication year equals 2014. So we run the filter function with a data set and then a so-called predicate. So some sort of um, operation um, or a um, <clears throat> that that basically um, yields um, true and false values. Is this 2014? Yes or no? And if it is 2014, then we keep it. So if we run this deployer filter, uh, <clears throat> then we get a um, data set that is much reduced in size because we have limited ourselves to the samples from 2014. And apparently in this field of research, there were not um, that many um, samples yet um, in 2014. Um, so we only are left with um, a table with 11 rows, so only 11 samples. Um, <clears throat> we can um, um, make this, this predicate here arbitrarily complex. Um, and we can, for example, use something uh, that is a logical OR. We can uh, say, give us all samples that are from 2014 or that are from 2018. This is, of course, a much larger subset of the data set because in 2018, there is much more data. No? And so here we end up with a, um, a table with 140 samples. <clears throat> um, there is um, in R a, a um, because this is a very common oper operation, um, there is a, a more neat way to write this with this um, in operator. Um, it's called the match operator. <clears throat> and um, with this, we can express this very quickly. Now we can say the publication year in a vector 2014 and 2018. And then we get um, the very same result. 
Now this is this is uh, functionally identical, just a little bit more or um, a neat way to write it. And of course, if you can do logical ors, then we can also do logical ends. So we can um, apply a filter condition uh, where we want only samples that fulfill two criteria or multiple criteria. So we want samples that are from species Homo sapiens and that are from a um, oral microbiome community. That's where these samples are coming from. So we run this and we get um, just the samples that fulfill these criteria, uh, apparently a lot, uh, 560. That's a large chunk of the, the total data set. <clears throat> OK, um, now we know um, selecting and filtering. And now I want to introduce something um, that will, will change your view of the world. You change your view of R altogether, and that is the pipe. Ha -ha. Um, the pipe is also part of the tidyverse um, <clears throat> through a package no? through a package called uh, Macrit R, which is some sort of French wordplay. Don't think about it. <clears throat> but this uh, Macrit R package introduces a clever infix operator that allows to chain data and operations. So we load the Macrit R package. Uh, we run this, and then we can do the following: we take our data set samples and pipe it into the filter function. So this is um, the very thing we just did. Um, but now the samples is not here anymore. It is somewhat uh, somehow added up here uh, before the function, actually. <clears throat> and if we run this, now we get, we get exactly what we already know. So these um, 11 samples here that fulfill this condition. And how does this work? Well, um, <clears throat> the pipe um, takes the um, left-hand side argument, the thing that is to its left, and applies the first argument in a function appearing on its right-hand side, so here. And that allows to um, <clears throat> sequence or to chain functions in a brilliant way, um, at least I would argue. And um, this is also what people call the tidyverse style of writing code or writing data analysis because it's, in my opinion, super readable. We start with the samples data set. We pipe it into the select function where we want um, the um, <clears throat> um, two columns, sample host and community type. So to extract these two columns, uh, and if we just run this um, by selecting it and pressing Control Enter, <clears throat> we end up with a data set with just these two columns and then um, we go one step further, we pipe the result of this operation into the filter function where we apply then our filter on um, sample host and um, um, community type again. So here we go. <clears throat> um, and uh, then we even pipe this result further to a function called nrow. So um, this is a function to count the number of rows of a um, data frame or a tibula. And if we run this, then we end up with a simple number, which is 561, uh, the number we've already seen. Um, uh, this chain operation is, is super useful um, <clears throat> for, the, um, um, for the ones of you who are maybe already a little bit more experienced. Uh, this Macrita pipe or the Macrita package also a number, uh, offers a number of other operators, uh, one of which um, is this um, dollar operator. Um, <clears throat> which is something I find myself using um, quite often. It's quite useful because it allows extraction in the pipe. Uh, so we have our samples data set. We apply a filter and um, to get only the samples where the material is um, a tooth. No? So uh, samples from tooths, of teeth. And then um, we um, use this dollar operator to access the sample age column uh, and we get just that. We just get a vector of all the sample ages. And then we can even pipe this further. Uh, we can type the, uh, pipe this uh, sample age uh, vector um, into a function to determine the maximum. Uh, and uh, just like that, we know how old is the oldest tooth sample in this data set. And you see at this point, um, <clears throat> we're reaching the, the point where these, these little um, operations we're doing here are becoming useful and helpful because they, they um, start to help us answer questions about the data set. 
uh, we, we start to do conditional queries. Um, <clears throat> one particular useful um, aspect of R in that regard is that it already includes a number of these helpful summary statistics. Yeah? So we've already seen um, n row and maximum, and there are more. Yeah? <clears throat> so these are just simple functions for um, summarizing and counting data. Um, and um, uh, you will we will find them. Um, you, know, you will use them quite a lot um, if you if you um, start seriously digging into R. Yeah? The n row um, function, which gives us the uh, number of um, rows in a, a particular data set, uh, the length function, which gives us the size of a vector, <clears throat> the unique function, which gives us the unique elements of a vector. Huh? So um, if we look at samples uh, material just by itself, huh, we, have, we have this, this large um, amount of repetition, of course. With the unique um, as, um, function, we can break this or um, bring this down to just the individual elements. Um, this is um, for practical applications, super useful, for example, when we uh, want to um, 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 find um, um, or clean our data. No? So um, we want to make sure that we don't have uh, 15 different ways of spelling dental calculus in our data set no? with the unique function to see right away if this is the case or not. Now that there are um, simple mathematical operations like the minimum, the maximum, the mean, no? the median, the variance, the standard deviation, and um, <clears throat> the quantile function, um, which is a little bit more complicated because you need this additional argument to um, tell um, where actually the, the quantile threshold, uh, threshold should be set. All right, but this is basically this um, <clears throat> statistical focus of, of R shining through that these operations are part of the um, base language implementation. Um, one additional thing, um, <clears throat> um, R has a way of uh, dealing with missing values. Uh, so if we come up with a, um, a vector, then um, this vector can have missingness, explicit missingness with this NA value. Now, and if we then uh, type this um, <clears throat> um, vector with a missing value into something like the max function, now, then we would um, um, encounter an issue here um, <clears throat> because um, of course, uh, this NA value might be bigger or lo lower than the others, so the max function has no clean result. Uh, but fortunately, there is an option um, to fix that. So the max function, many of these other mathematical, simple mathematical summary functions um, have a argument called NR, uh, NARM, so remove the NA values. And if I set this to true, so T or true, then I will get the, the maximum I expect, which is three. Okay, <clears throat> um, and now um, with these summary functions, we come to um, one of the uh, most important sections of this R introduction. And that, uh, these are group-wise summaries, with group by and summarize. Um, <clears throat> and that is something um, we want to do um, extremely often if we are in practical data analysis, group-wise summaries. So, we just learned about these summary statistics, and I would argue they are particularly useful when we can apply them to conditional subsets of a data set. And Deployer allows just to do that. No? It allows such summary operations um, with a combination of group by and summarize. These are the two functions that we have to memorize, no? group by and summarize. How does this work? Here's an example. We take our samples data set, and we pipe it into the group by function. And um, this group by function um, <clears throat> takes um, an argument, which is the um, column by which we want to group. So in this case, we want to group by the material column. Uh, and the material column, we still have it um, um, open here. Uh, these are these materials. So they are samples from sediment, from skin, from paleophysis. Now uh, there, is, there is a category for every shit, basically. Uh, bone samples, leaves, and so forth. Huh? <clears throat> and um, now we want to group by exactly these. So if we run this, then let's see what we get. We get, again, our tibble, but this time our tibble has some sort of um, feature. Huh? It is grouped. It has um, this additional grouping meta um, um, category here. 
So it is grouped in a um, in 19 different groups based on um, the material. And now, as it is grouped, we can forward it, we can pipe it further into the summarize function. And this function now allows us to apply operations to the per uh, ma material category subsets, groups. <clears throat> and we can make new columns um, for these. We can, for example, make a column with the minimum age, the sample age, the minimum of the sample age, um, <clears throat> the median of the sample age, and the maximum of the sample age for these groups. So and as this might be a little bit abstract, let's look at the result and it will become immediately clear. The result we get is, again, a tibble, but this time we have one row for each material category, and then these three columns that we, um, um, <clears throat> that we created, the three new variables, the minimum age, the medium age, and the maximum age. Um, <clears throat> And um, you can imagine that is um, uh, super powerful because now we could um, very easily compare these different categories and their uh, respective age ranges. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh, grouping um, can be applied across multiple columns. So we, don't know, we cannot just group by material, but we can also group by a second category, um, the sample host. Right? So you remember if this is from a Homo sapiens or from um, from some um, some sort of, of monkey or ape. And um, <clears throat> if we apply this, no, then uh, we get, of course, more groups, not the 19 we have for material, but the, the 48 um, that um, are a result of uh, multiplying sample age categories, uh, sample host categories with the material categories. So 48 groups. And we can um, <clears throat> now uh, apply, again apply the summarize function. Here I chose an example where we count the number of values per category, because this might be a useful question we have now. So how many um, tooth samples do we have for Homo sapiens or something? No? <clears throat> and for that, we create a new column called n. And um, <clears throat> then um, uh, call this the plier n um, function, which is basically a way to count um, within these groups. Um, if we run this, no, what we get is, is this. No? So I tibble, we have the material category and the second grouping variable, the sample host, um, and uh, the number of samples we have for each combination. So we have 80 bone samples from um, Homo sapiens. And um, from whatever that is, I guess some sort of monkey, right? I mean, no, okay, some sort of rabbit. All, all right, all right. <clears throat> anyway, we have just one bone sample from them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure some of you already saw this here. Um, the thing is, um, um, under um, um, certain circumstances, I think, yeah, <clears throat> if we do not have this, if we do not have at this, uh, this line here. If we remove it here, <clears throat> what we will get is a data set which is still grouped by one of these um, <clears throat> um, grouping um, columns. It is still grouped by material. It's not grouped by sample host anymore, but it's still grouped by material. It's a little bit of a weird feature of this grouping. And I usually do not like it. I like to keep my, my grouping separate and uh, try to make sure that um, at the end of my summarized operation, everything is a clean, normal tibble again. And that's why I um, often call or find myself calling this um, um, dot groups um, equals drop argument. So to drop the grouping after the summary, uh, um, a summary operation. OK. Um, all right, um, <clears throat> then um, we learned about grouping now. Um, <clears throat> and grouping can be very well combined with, with sorting. And I will explain this. First of all, how does sorting work um, in, in Deplier? Well, there is a function called arrange. Um, and arrange um, is just a, um, a simple sorting operation. No? So we say, um, take our samples data set and sort it by publication here. I think um, not that much changes by 
No, okay, now it is actually uh, different, yeah. So now here we have all the um, um, samples from 2014 at the very beginning. Um, <clears throat> wherever you would like to do this, no? there might be applications where you want to sort your data, for example, your output table when you're preparing your final um, data set for the publication. Um, <clears throat> and then um, we can also say, um, group by uh, sort by multiple variables now by publication year and then within the publication year by sample age. Uh, that's what we can do like this. Um, <clears throat> and we can also sort um, descendingly, so start with the with the biggest value. Um, so here we wrap the sample age column by which we want to sort into this call to divide descendant, and then we sort descendingly on the sample age. And if we run this, uh, we end up with another sorted version of this data set that starts with a very old sample, of course. Um, and then um, the thing that I um, actually want to highlight, the brilliant thing, sorting also works within groups and it can be paired with something that is a slice operation to extract extreme values. That is super useful. An example. So we take the samples data set, pipe it, pipe it. Clemens, into, yeah. um, I have the, the same question that Maria in the chat. Oh, yes. um, The drop for I did not understand what you do. The drop, the drop. What did I drop? This one here. Ah, okay. <clears throat> All right. So this is a pretty technical thing, um, which is um, yeah. I understand that this is confusing. So <clears throat> um, let's run this again. If I run this grouping operation. Just like this, as you would usually want to do it. Now you group by material. Let's, let's make it even more clean and concise here. So <clears throat> we group by material and sample host. And then we summarize and count. We just count how many um, observations we have for each of these combinations of, for, of the combinations of material and sample host. Then we end up with the correct result. This is exactly as we, as we expect it to be. Now we have a column for the material. We have a column for the sample host, and we have the n, which is the count of the, the observations that fulfill these two conditions. But what we also still have is we still have an active grouping. So there still is some grouping going on and some grouping assigned to this data set. And if we now do anything else with this data set, I mean, we don't do this here, but if you are in your data analysis and you want to continue working with this data set, you might forget that there is still a grouping active. And then you might perform some operation in a group manner, which you do not want to do in a group manner, which you want to apply to the whole data set. And so that's why I think it's better to explicitly tell the buyer to drop this grouping and give you a data set that is completely virgin and ungrouped without any special meta information which is just a normal table without any grouping meta information. And that is what this groups drop does. It's just some, some safety precaution to make sure that we don't forget or that we um, don't end up doing something that we do not want to do. I, I honestly, I do not understand why the default is actually to keep the grouping. grouping. I don't know why they choose to do this. OK, thank you. All right. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about arranging, <clears throat> and I just wanted to show this, this cool workflow to find extreme values per group, because that's something I um, do um, uh, yeah, quite frequently, actually. <clears throat> so we take our sample data set, uh, and we um, group it by publication here in this case. So we get the same table, but this time with this meta information that is grouped. And now we can run deployer arrange, and deployer arrange will now run within each group. And that is exactly what I just highlighted with the, with the dropping and the grouping, right? If we do any other operation on the data set now, it will, be, um, <clears throat> it will be applied on the individual groups. So it will not um, sort the entire data set, it will sort only within the publication year groups. <clears throat> and we run this um, and we sort descendingly by sample age. 
So <clears throat> what we get now is, is just a data set um, cleverly uh, grouped and sorted. And now um, um, they, um, the order of these, um, um, <clears throat> or the grouping allows us now to take um, values from each group subset. And that is done with slice. No? And there is a function called slice hat to take the first two um, samples um, <clears throat> of a, a data set. And because we are still have the grouping active, no? that's why we um, keep only the first two samples per group. And as they are sorted, and we take the first two samples, we get the two oldest samples per group. Here. No? <clears throat> And you see, this is a shorter data set. Now we just have um, 40 samples left here. Um, but they are the oldest for each publication year. So the oldest samples for 2014, the oldest samples for 2016, the oldest samples for 2017, and so forth. <clears throat> um, but um, and um, then um, I, um, at the end of this operation, we still have some grouping left over here, which I do not want to forget about. So I run deployer ungroup, which does exactly the same thing as uh, the drop group. Huh? Just another way to do the same thing. Again, we drop the grouping at the end to not forget about it, not uh, that we do not get confused in the end. All right. <clears throat> um, uh, and this is like, I think this is a clever way to answer questions, like to um, group, sort, and then take some, uh, some values um, or some extreme values um, out of this. Okay. Um, then um, <clears throat> just um, as an additional tiny hint, uh, slicing is also the relevant operation if you want to take random samples from a table. So if you want to have 20 random samples, then we can um, run something that is called slice sample with um, n equals 20. So give us 20 samples, 20 random samples from this data set. Now we can run this multiple times. We always get 20 different um, samples from our input table. All right, so it's time for another exercise. <clears throat> and I think this will be the last thing we can do um, for today. Uh, which is a little bit of a pity, but um, <clears throat> uh, I mean, the material is all there. Um, you can um, easily dive in deeper. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's valuable now to conclude um, with a, an exercise on these um, um, conditional queries, which is a very important topic. So here, let's go down here. And oops, that's also the solutions here. So I would again like you to work with the empty car data sets, empty cars. And um, <clears throat> I would like you to determine the number of cars with four forward gears. And I would like you to determine the mean um, uh, quarter mile um, time um, per number of cylinders. And then finally, identify the least efficient car for both transmission types. Let's go ahead. Oh, is this an open question? I'm a bit confused why the grouping is kept if you don't save it in a variable. Um, yeah, I'm also confused why it's kept. <laughs> but it's some meta information, like why it's not in a variable. It's some meta information that is attached to the table. Why it's kept around, I also don't understand. I find myself usually removing it explicitly then after the summarizing operation.
Okay, yes. Um, uh, now, also, maybe other people from the, the uh, Python portion are coming in. Um, I think um, we um, have to uh, resolve, so I can quickly um, show um, some solutions uh, that I came up with um, for these issues. Um, I have it here. So, um, you should see uh, my screen. This is now just another R Studio session. Um, and um, here for the, uh, the number of cars with four forward gears, I used uh, the Plyo filter and set the gear to four. And then I also um, prepended here this call to n row. So to actually get a, a number. So apparently there are 12 cars with, um, a, uh, with um, four gears. Then uh, the mean um, <clears throat> quarter mile time per number of cylinders um, that um, is actually you know, equivalent or fits to the plot we already did before. And for that, I uh, group by the number of cylinders, uh, number of cylinder group, and then I summarize the mean um, or the mile um, speed in seconds uh, with this uh, mean operation. Uh, if I run this, then I get a data set like this. Uh, so the, the more cylinders, uh, the faster the cars get, apparently. And then for the last question, uh, the, <clears throat> um, the least efficient car for both transmission types. Um, and for that, um, we um, did this, um, or I did this um, trick by arranging and then slicing. So um, I can call to that and I get um, the two different cars because we have two tra transmission types, uh, a manual and um, automatic transmission. Um, uh, with um, the um, yeah, um, <clears throat> best or like the worst um, uh, amount of miles per gallon. Okay, um, I fear that um, concludes the R session. We <laughs> achieved approximately half of what I hoped we would. Uh, but as I said, um, <clears throat> um, you can um, go through this material quickly yourself. Uh, it should all be self contained and working. Um, and um, um, the, like on the website, there is uh, the updated, the new material, uh, which also then includes uh, the exercises and uh, uh, the solutions to it. Um, because as um, many, um, some of you might not have um, these uh, solutions in their document on their VM right now. All right. Um, thank you very much. Then.